Are you feeling the joy? Are you feeling the joy? This is about joy this morning, and I want to talk to you, I hope, that about joy and explain why joy comes from Easter. We've got a lot of territory to cover. I'm going to Rome this morning. I'm going to um, some great words this morning, including hippopotamuses. Is. Hippopotamuses. So if you hear me say hippopotamus, this is a bit interactive this morning. Say hippopotami. If you hear me say Frankie goes to Hollywood this morning, say the power of love. If you, yeah. <clears throat> if you hear me say resurrection this morning, say he's alive. So let's start. Resurrection. Alive. Amen. Happiness, according to the experts, is a feeling based on circumstances. Joy, on the other hand, is an attitude that defies circumstances. It's quite profound. I quite like that. I need to think about that. I hope you do too. It defies circumstances. Easter defies circumstances and is the root and the only real reason that we can have joy and celebrate and dance and sing because if you hadn't noticed the world around us is full of suffering full of death and full of tough times so how on earth can we celebrate when there's so much misery in the world it's true isn't it but it's true we can and I want to try and explain why because I'm excited this morning to preach the truth that I believe is the most fundamental important world-changing radical truth that has ever been known. It is the most significant thing. It is what the Christian faith is based upon. It is what hope is based upon. It is what the future of mankind and all creation is based upon. I want to preach that truth to you this morning. And I want to be a witness to the impact that has had on my life, this truth. Two things. And finally, I want to offer you the gift of faith. It's something I cannot bring to you. something I cannot give you. It's something that you cannot build up. You can, you can just, the only thing you can do is to receive the gift of faith. And we're going to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. Okay, so lots of things to cover this morning. I'm going to start in Rome. There it is before me. I was very happy and lucky to go to Rome for a week with Sally celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. What a place. The eternal city full of ancient relics and beautiful uh, people, a beautiful city, um, beautiful food, uh, just amazing. And we did a bit of history. I mean, it's like I've come back from, uh, 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 it's like I've come, I feel like I'm so ready uh, to, to speak to you. I feel like I've come from the, the year 50. It's like going back in time. That building there is the Colosseum. It is literally 2,000 years old. It, and it's still standing. It was around just about or just after the time that Jesus was alive on earth. It's that old, and yet it's that close. And it brings it real that Jesus and his disciples, this is the town city of Rome where so much happened that is where Paul the disciple ended up. He appealed to Caesar. The Roman Empire covered a, a quarter of the world's um, territory and population. It was absolutely enormous. It was a center of power in that time when Jesus was alive. It was phenomenal what was going on there. And it's still standing, some of it today. And the Colosseum is uh, typical, possibly, of uh, showing us what was going on in that time. The Colosseum was a place of the games where gladiators would come and do battle unto death. It was where multiple animals from all over the world, including, according to the audio guide, hippopotamuses. Amazing. They're Italian. They should know the Latin. Hippopotami, surely. Is that right, teachers? No? I don't know. Um, I just love that word, though. You can't just say hippopotamuses without smiling, can you? I can't. I love it. Hippopotami. And, and so they brought all these uh, incredible uh, creatures from all over the, the known world to celebrate and have, bring entertainment and kill them, basically. This was an arena of death. It was like 
the, the Death Star for Rome. It, it, this was where people died. This is where they were executed if they were criminals. This is where oppressed people were fed to the lions, including potentially, at least in places like this, Christians as well, and many other oppressed people that Rome dominated. This was the, the, the highlight, the, 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 the epicenter of everything that was awful and violent about the Roman Empire. But you'll see it's also a significant reflection that the powers that be are still at it today. We're still killing each other. We're still defying uh, each other. We're still in the same place. And um, it, 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 it was sobering to see it. But we also saw amazing things of hope. We saw the first catacombs where the earliest Christian um, uh, communities in Rome uh, buried their buried their, um, their dead and, and painted pictures. The earliest ever pictorial representation of the Virgin Mary and her baby. We saw it. We could see it underground in Rome. 2,000 years old. It's still there. It's amazing. Um, just so many beautiful things and um, powerful things. And uh, I've done some research as well as being in Rome um, about what on earth Easter is all about. If you're confused by Easter, if you're not clear what the message of Easter is, I'm delighted that you're here. I certainly am learning every single year about what it is. The uh, first Easter that I had, after I'd given my life to Jesus, I was about 20 years old, I was in the, the pub with my pals. Frankie Goes to Hollywood was singing, Power of Love, A Forge from Above. And I was thinking, That's what Easter's about. The power of love affording from above. Unbelievable. Not that probably that was the intended message from the song, if you knew Frankie Goes to Hollywood. But I heard it. That's what I heard. I heard the gospel preached by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Man, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what it is. The, the name Easter many of you may know or you may not, is actually a pagan goddess, Easter, German, I think. And uh, what used to happen was the church in the early centuries would try and just take hold of existing rituals and um, put Christian festivals on them. So they started to celebrate Easter to celebrate the resurrection. And um, it's maintained that title ever since for 2,000 years. It's um, date. Who knows the date of Easter ever? It's like, oh, Google it. What is it? It is, um, used to be the, the Sunday of the Passover. Jesus obviously started and, resur you know, he used the Passover festival of the Jewish um, uh, 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 people to instigate and explain what he was doing. And the day of Passover became the day of celebrating Easter resurrection for a while. And, and then in 325 AD, you'll be fascinated to know, it became uh, linked to the Roman uh, calendar, uh, and it followed the lunar calendar that celebrated the, f the first Sunday after the spring equinox, I think. Confused? What's the message of Easter? The Easter Bunny came along about the 18th century, part of the, uh, again, another pagan sort of thing, with a wild hare that used to bring... Um, eggs to children, good, good children. It, it, it is easy to see why it's hard to know what the real message of Easter is. But I want to be utterly clear. It is wholly about resurrection. He is alive. Thank you. I remembered. He is alive. This is Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. This is... <laughs> I'm going to regret this. <laughs> Paul writes to the people of Rome in the day, back in the day, back in that day, Paul writes to them and says this, the people of Rome, in the book of Romans, same place. Amazing. I was like there just last week. Anyway, um, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, he says in Roman one, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand. 
through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Amen. Jesus Christ our Lord is alive. He is resurrected from the dead. He has not been reincarnated. He has not been uh, made an eternal spirit. He is bodily raised to life. This was bodily resurrection. Nobody in all creation had ever thought the resurrection was an option for anybody, ever. Just because they were 2,000 years ago, they were no more expecting resurrection than you or I are today. This is not about science saying, well, actually, that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. They had no possible idea that this was going to happen, and we can read about it here, but it did. Next slide. What I found in the Colosseum was this. In the arena of death... That started. The cross was placed. Eventually, the Colosseum was adopted by the church, it became a place to recognize the martyrs, and the cross remains. That the Romans crucified Jesus, and yet, within 300 years, what was more powerful? The cross the cross, and it's there today, and it's there pointing to us, and it's what I wear around my neck, and it reminds me of what the gospel is, that Jesus is alive. He is resurrected from the dead. He is alive. Hallelujah. This is the message. This is what I found. If you're still unsure of what Christianity, why Christianity has survived for 2,000 years against all the odds. This is why. Because somebody was raised from the dead. And we have, through the Gospels, a clear, lucid account of what happened on that first Easter Sunday. We, we have it in good authority. This is written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. This is the account of the Gospels. We, we can see it, and it's written here, and somehow we miss it. We get direct, misdirected by all these different things that are going on, and we miss this. But I want to bring it to your attention again this morning. More than anything else in the world, I want to bring this to your attention. This is what happened. Here's one of the accounts. This is the one in Luke. And uh, Luke 24, verses 36 to 53, uh, picks up the story of Jesus. He's um, been seen um, by the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and uh, they're like, what? And they completely turned direction, went back to uh, Jerusalem, met the disciples. While they were talking about it and discussing it, it says this, while they were still talking about it, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, just let me run that by you again. Jesus, who was completely and utterly crucified. I mean, you don't get up from that. He was dead, rolled uh, uh, behind the stone. The stone was rolled, protecting him from possibly being stolen. <laughs> Nobody thought he was actually going to rise from the dead. They thought they might pretend. But here it is. Jesus himself stood among them and said to him, then peace be with you. Like you or I, and we are there right now. We are there right now. We're hearing it. This is a good account, a credible account of what actually happened, but it's completely unbelievable. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Well, wouldn't you? The guy's dead. He's right standing in front of me. There is nothing that says, oh, yeah, I knew that. He was, he was going to rise from the dead. Would you have said that? Would we see it today? Uh -uh. We, we, we're like them. They're not different. They're humans, and they're going like, you have to be a ghost. And he says, look at my hands. 
actually, why are you troubled, Jesus says. I'll tell you why. You're dead and you're standing right in front of me. That's why I'm troubled. Why do doubts rise in your mind? Because it doesn't happen. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have fl flesh and bones as you see I have. This was bodily resurrection. He had flesh and bones. He was not a spirit. He was a resurrected human being, fully divine, resurrected, the firstborn, we learn later, of all creation. This is what is on offer to you and to me. This is the gospel, bodily resurrection, the victory over death. That is the gospel. That is why it is the most significant, world-changing, life-changing news that you have ever heard. This is what the gospel is, that you will rise again, bodily resurrection, and whatever state your condition of body is, whether you're carbon atoms floating around the universe, the power of God will bring you together and resurrect you into a spiritual body. That is the promise of Jesus. That is the gospel. This is what Christianity is all about. It is bodily resurrection. Death is defeated. There is a future hope for every single one of us. Death no longer reigns. Amen. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Still not sure? Let's have a fish supper. Literally. Literally. That's what happened. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He's, he's alive. He's eating. He's with them. And that's what we're promised in Revelation. He will come and eat with you. He is sharing intimacy. He's sharing life with us again. This is the gospel message. This is the hope that he will actually come and eat with us and be close to us and be intimate with us. He's just not going to explain it. He's just not going to show it. He's going to come and be with us. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He had been explaining it a long way. The Old Testament, the law, the laws, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, the stuff we read, the Old Testament that we have today, tells us, actually, if we read it right, that, yeah, this, this was prophesied. This, was, this had to happen. And, and, and this is what happens. This is so important because I'm not just telling you, well, I'm just telling you evidence of something and asking you to believe it. I'm also going to ask you to enter in to what the, what the first disciples experienced. They saw it firsthand. They had that privilege. And it even says in the gospel, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's you and I. We weren't in their room, but we can read about it. We can't actually touch it, but we can feel it. But what we can do is experience the same thing that the disciples went on to experience. Here it is. He said to them, in verse Luke 24, 45, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That is what happens in response to the gift of faith. You think, well, am I going to get healed? Am I going to get rich? Am I going to get better at life? Am I going to become more moral? What is, why do we come to follow Jesus? Do we, we probably come to want a better life, probably. But actually, what we're offered is something different. Firstly, peace. Secondly, that the scriptures 
the Bible, the most boring book in the whole world, until I read it with faith, this gift of faith, and it suddenly became the most precious, the most important, the most incredible, the most wise, the most valuable, the most relevant book in the whole world, from listening to Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Thank you. Power of love affords from above. Every single day, this beautiful Bible has started to speak to me and started to help me over 40 years gradually get to understand, oh, this is true. This is what had to happen. And that gift is available for you. That's what you're going to get. If you decide to follow Jesus, you're going to get this weird love of the Bible. (laughs) Anybody want it? If you receive it, it will be the most transformational thing that you've ever been given as a gift. Plus the peace. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. The other thing you get, as well as a love and understanding of the truth about Jesus, the truth about God, the truth about the world. That's a pretty good start. You get peace, and you get empowerment, and you get direction for your whole life. You start to want to do what Jesus wants to do. You start to want to follow him. You start to want to become like him. You start to want to understand him more. You want to start to experience him more. You want to start telling people about him. That's what happens when you become a Christian. That's the promise that Jesus gave. That's the experience of the disciples. They were completely and utterly transformed from people hiding to people declaring to people being empowered to people that started a revolution, a transformation. That is why we're here today. That's the power of the gospel. This is the good news, but it's not just based on a fact. It's based on an experience that you and I and people throughout the 2,000 years have been experiencing the same thing, the presence of Jesus in our hearts, this miracle, the presence uh, and the power of the, of the gospel, of the Bible speaking to us and teaching to us, and, and being clothed with power to pray, to want to come to church. You want to come to church, be filled with the Holy Spirit, believe, and he will start to give you those desires. You want to start to um, change. I stopped swearing the day I gave my life to Jesus. I've been trying to do it for, well, a few weeks, probably. I just, it just stopped. I started to be changed and transformed. That's my witness to you today. I'm telling you, I'm not just telling you a fact, I'm telling you I've experienced all these things and it's available for you. I've been sent and you'll be sent. You'll be given purpose, you'll be given uh, a sense of identity that is beyond your circumstances, beyond who you are. You're, you're adopted in the, to the family of God of God. Your identity comes from the Father in heaven himself. You start to hope and believe that the kingdom of God is coming. That actually life after death is real and it's true. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, it goes on, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. This is Jesus and the disciples. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Then they worshipped him and return to Jerusalem with great joy. That's where real joy comes from. Whatever your circumstances are, whatever you face in the arena of life, in the arena of death, that life is at the moment. You can have Jesus with you. You can have the cross at the center of your lives. You can hold on to that hope. You can enjoy his Uh, presence and his peace. You can have that hope that whatever happens to me, even death itself, I know there's more to life than that. Hallelujah. Great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. You will start to celebrate. You will start to rejoice because you see that the world is not as you thought it. It's not just a gladiatorial arena of death, which is what it feels like. If I could have the band back up ready to celebrate that would be great and just as I conclude and I want to give you the opportunity to receive this gift of faith the arena is a great metaphor for life and it might just help one or two of you I hope it does I've been trying to 
articulate this. When I've been in there, when I stood there in that cross, in the arena, I was like, gosh, what is, what is going on? And God started to speak to me and started to show me that um, the, the, the gladiatorial arena is, 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 a, is a metaphor for life because death reigns in it. And for some of us, we're trying to be gladiators, trying to win. Of course we are. We're trying to succeed in the arena of life. We're trying to make the most of the um, four score years and ten. And uh, we maybe even come to Jesus to, to help us make a better fist of it in the arena of life. We want to be successful in our world. We want to be successful in work and home and stuff like that. And we ask Jesus to come and help us in our arena. And for others, life is just, we're like being fed to the lions. Life has been brutal. Bad health, bad relationships, bad everything. And we're like, gosh, just get me out of here. So we come to Jesus, get me out of here and take me to heaven. But that's not the gospel message, neither of those things. The gospel that Jesus brought was not a, a, a way to live in the arena better, although it does help you. It's not a way to just let you escape and get to heaven, although it does. He was giving and presenting a whole new world. This, the, the, if the arena of the Colosseum represents life and death, dominated by death, Jesus was coming and saying, the kingdom of God is coming, and it is a kingdom of life. It is a completely different arena. It is a spiritual arena where our resurrected bodies will live in eternity. And he's preparing us for it. He says, go and tell everybody, I'm coming back. And this is the gospel message that the arena, the kingdom of eternity, the kingdom of the heavens, the kingdom of Jesus is coming to earth. And the, uh, the coming together of creation of the heavenly realms and the earthly realms are coming together as one. We are going to reign with resurrected spiritual bodies in a, a unified uh, heaven and earth. The uh, Eden is coming back. The separation between man and God is completely defeated. And he was the firstborn of all creation. And every single person has taken a step of faith and believed in him and received him has entered into that kingdom and started to live in eternity and eternal life and start to become a spiritual being. And then Jesus is coming back. He promises to come back. He's coming back, but he's coming back with the whole of heaven and bringing unity with heaven and earth together. It's impossible to believe without the gift of faith. Science can't explain it. Philosophy can't lead you there. Any understanding, any moral success, any goodness, anything that you've ever done cannot prepare your mind to receive this truth that all of creation is coming together and I want to ask you just to stand now and if you want to receive this gift of faith just like the disciples were before Jesus full of doubts full of fear if you can take either of those boxes if you're doubting if you're not sure but you're willing to receive the gift of faith. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine that you're in the room with the disciples. Jesus comes. He says, look, I'm alive. I'm resurrected. Believe in me, trust in me, receive my Holy Spirit, receive this gift of faith, and be all my witnesses to all the world. That offer is for you. It's a complete game changer, completely transforming how we understand the world, the universe, and creation. That I believe it's the absolute truth as to what we're what we can experience and what is coming, that there is a God who is rescuing the world. And the suffering we're facing in the moment is because we're still in the arena. The kingdom has started with resurrection on Easter day. That is not finished, but it is coming to a conclusion one day. And we hope for that. We want to get ready for that. We want to be prepared for that. We want to get ready for the eternal kingdom. 
receive the gift of faith today. Just, just imagine whatever your doubts are, whatever your fears are, whatever your reservations are, whatever is causing you to doubt and say this is impossible. Yes, it is. But not by faith. This Easter, receive the gift of faith. Receive the gift of faith. And I pray now, receive the gift of faith. Receive it. Receive it. Receive this gift of faith. Receive the gift of faith that disciples have. And be transformed and allow it to transform you. Receive the promise of peace. Receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Receive the promise of um, passion for him. It's the new covenant that Jesus promised that the scriptures read us to. It's the new covenant that he will put on his spirit in us. He'll put his promises in us, his word in us. Thank you, Jesus. Receive it now. Receive the gift of faith. You can't earn it. You can never be ready for it. You can never be prepared for it. You just need to receive it. Let this truth become real to you. He's alive. Death is defeated. There is a future hope and a future place where we're together, we're in unity, we're alive in the eternal presence of God, in the glory of God will fill the earth. Thank you, Jesus. For the joy set before him, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down with he knew joy was coming. He knew how to bring it, and he wants you to receive it right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've felt you've responded to that for the first time or for a new time, you need to take the next steps. I encourage you to come and tell somebody that this is the first time I've ever really decided to follow Jesus, believe in him, and, and trust him. I'm full of doubts, I'm full of fears, I'm full of anxieties, but I want to do it. Just talk to somebody you came with or talk to me or one of the people in the church and tell them and be ready for what's coming. The peace, the power, the joy, the purpose, the love, in Jesus' name. And for the rest of us that I hope is refocusing your lives on the cross, be refreshed, be renewed, be rebooted this Easter with that thought that the cross is overcoming everything, that Jesus is alive. And the right response for all who have received is to turn and praise and praise and praise and praise. So let's praise, shall we? Can we have good grace, perhaps? Yes, yes. Come on, come on. Amen, 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 amen.